Well, greetings, everyone. It's great to have you here for another evening of great decisions. Uh, today, this evening, we are going to be focused on a topic I think that is of interest to almost everyone, and that is drug policy in Latin America. And we have a um, world acclaimed expert among us, Dr. Evan Ellis, who will be joining us in this discussion. Before we do that, though, I want to let you know that we have about two more um, in our series. This will go on, the next one will be on the Quad Alliance. Um, and we'll be looking forward to your joining us for that. But we also have several events coming up. We're going to start our summer internship program soon for high school and college students. And we are still intensely working with the Pub Public Health Management Corporation to promote vaccines in our region. So you'll be hearing from us about vaccine clinics and we continually are providing education to our community, education they can trust, information they can trust about vaccines and about the science of COVID-19. So uh, I also want to let you know that on uh, Saturday, we'll be joining with the Civic Club of Haver Harrisburg and we'll be uh, sponsoring an Easter egg hunt at the Civic Club there on Front Street. So it's from 1030 to 1. So I hope you will come out and bring the kiddies with you as well. It'll be a fun evening. With that, I think we are going to now simply go into our Great Decisions video. You know how this works. We watch a video produced by the Foreign Policy Association that basically lays out what the issues are. At the end of that, I will give a proper and formal introduction to Dr. Evan Ellis, who will lead us in our discussion this evening. So with that, Zach, are you there to start our video? 2022 a masterclass brought to you by the Foreign Policy Association. There are nine topics in this masterclass. We are now at the point of looking at topic number seven, which is drug policy towards Latin America and the Caribbean. We have declared war on a number of entities over time. If we look back to the early 1940s, there was the declaration of war against Germany Italy and Japan, the Axis powers of World War II. There was a declaration of war on illicit drugs in the 1970s and a declaration of war against global terror. Most recently, we've declared war on COVID. So what this tells us is that declarations of war are mere words. The question is what sort of policies underwrite them, give them life, and allow us to achieve our national interests. Before we can consider American foreign policy options, there are three main considerations. We're gonna look at the bureaucratic landscape of dealing with international drug policy, the extent of the problem from Latin America, and then finally, Latin America's own drug problem. We begin with the bureaucratic landscape. The United States, of course, is a very complicated government. The White House on top, the president presides. Drug Enforcement Agency plays a central role in our war on drugs and our policy towards illicit drugs in Latin America and the Caribbean. But it's not the only federal agency that deals with drugs. Far from it. The landscape is littered with dozens of federal, regional, and state level agencies, all of them working together or against each other in confronting illicit drug trade, trafficking, and of course, use. There are 43 federal agencies alone involved in American drug policy globally, which includes, of course, Latin America. And they're very often struggling with and against each other. They're doing so for primacy, for attention, and for resources, or they simply struggle with each other because they speak different bureaucratic languages and have different protocols. There are several different theories of bureaucratic behavior that we can apply to American foreign policy. There is what we call RAM, or Rational Actor Model, Organizational Politics Model, or the OP Model, and then BP, which is Bureaucratic Politics Model. They explain foreign policy bureaucracies in stark terms. Let's begin with the rational actor model. It is by far the simplest and most straightforward. It is the ideal model for foreign policy making. 
It imagines the U.S. government as a unitary actor with a very clear head, which is the president, with information from all of the agencies flowing upward, being vetted and filtered, analyzed and polished, and ultimately making it to the president's desk. The assumption is that when the president and his or her team consider a foreign policy option, they have all of the best information at their disposal. Decisions flow downward in an authoritative fashion. When the president speaks, when the president decides, that is the policy that is implemented. And the country's overall interest, it is assumed in this model, prevail over all local, regional, and political interests. It's the perfect model of foreign policy, and if only foreign policy operated in this fashion. The organizational politics model has a very different system. It sees a number of organizations that are arrayed across the government, all of them involved in various foreign policy issues. For some issues, it's only a handful. For ones like drug policy, three or more dozen of them. They each have a head, Secretary of State, Director of Central Intelligence, the highest ranking members of the military, whether it's in the Pentagon or the Chiefs of Staff, all of them represented at the top. But these individual organizations have their own agendas, their own bureaucratic language, and their own interest. And it's their own parochial interest that oftentimes are pursued. We would like to think that the Defense Department and the State Department work together as much as we'd like to think that the CIA and FBI work together. But oftentimes they hide information from each other, they're competing against each other, and they view each other as bureaucratic rivals. That's the organizational politics model. And finally, and somewhat similar, is the bureaucratic politics model. Here we look only at the leadership of each of those organizations and where they sit around the table when the president enters the room. So clearly the head of the table is for the president, in the president's absence, the vice president, and then everyone else is arrayed around the table and where you sit determines where you stand. Meaning whatever label you have, sec def, sec state, director of CIA, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that determines your policy position. And if you have someone that moves from one institution in the government to another, it's amazing how quickly their policy issues change, their positions change, because where you sit around the table is where you stand on policy issues. And these elite policy makers, the heads of these large bureaucratic organizations, they trade horses with one another. They make trade-offs, they cut side deals. They're trying to create a winning coalition to gain the president's attention. It's called fighting for the president's ear. And if the president is listening to you, it's more likely that financial resources and responsibility will flow in your direction. That's the bureaucratic politics model. When we look at American agencies that deal with drug policy in Latin America, we cannot for a moment view this as the rational actor model. It is organizational and bureaucratic politics without any question. And that, of course, is not optimal. But it's not just about the United States. We're just one of many important players in the global battle against illicit drug trafficking and trade. In Latin America and the Caribbean, there are dozens of countries, each with their own bureaucratic battles. And somehow we have to overcome all of those battles, including ones with us, if we're going to coordinate policy across the entire region. What is the extent of the drug problem in the United States? The numbers don't tell us everything, but we do know that annually $150 billion of illegal drugs enter the United States. What does that mean in terms of cost for the U.S.? We'd have to calculate all of the medical treatments, the law enforcement efforts to crack down on drug dealers and drug consumers, the crime that is often related with addiction to drugs, and don't forget the lost productivity. 
When people become sick because of drugs, they can't go to work. When they die, we lose a lifetime of productivity. So the drug problem in the United States is enormous. Putting a price tag on it is virtually impossible. Here we can see the main global trafficking routes for illicit drugs. There are three sources. There is the so-called Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. That includes Myanmar, one of our great decisions this year. There is that Golden Crescent, which basically begins in Afghanistan, and then it has its travel routes throughout Africa and Europe. And then finally, today's great decisions challenge Latin America. As we look at our hemisphere, the drugs are largely produced in South America. They find their way to Central America, into Mexico, Caribbean islands, and on to the United States. The moment we crack down on land routes, the sea routes open up. We crack down on the sea routes, that opens the door for land routes. Very difficult to prevent the drugs from flowing into the United States. And once they reach our boundaries, they have a national network of highways and byways that they can use to spread across our great nation and poison our population. Latin America's drug problem is relatively straightforward. There are only three countries that promote or cultivate coca. That is, of course, the base of cocaine. They are Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. But from them, the drugs flow throughout the region and, of course, northward to the major markets in North America. In fact, 90% of the cocaine produced in South America arrives on American shores. The other 10% makes its way to Africa, to Europe, and beyond. Let's now consider American foreign policy options as it relates to drug policy three main areas of focus. There's the source of the drugs, where they're cultivated, where they're grown, where they're produced. Once they have finished production, there are transit routes that take them out of region and towards the United States and large markets. And then finally, the destination, which with cocaine in Latin America is overwhelmingly the United States. And it's the same for marijuana and other illicit drugs. Let's begin with the source. Well, we do have options at our disposal. We can fly planes over crops and poison them. We can spray all sorts of agents, chemicals on them that will make the leaves wilt and turn brown and ultimately die. We can do this on the ground directly with the assistance, of course, of local governments. And we can also go there and simply burn the fields to the ground. The problem is that these fields are so massive in size and very oftentimes they're in areas that are very difficult to get to. Add to that the reality that if we're gonna to spray toxins over these areas, defoliants as we used in Vietnam with Agent Orange, we're gonna cause a lot of civilian damage, deformation and death. There have been major moves to have locals replace their coca production with, with other profitable market items such as coffee or soy, rice or cotton. This is something that can happen if we're willing to subsidize it. Basically do abroad what we do for our farmers here at home, give them a leg up economically so that they can make a profit by selling in a highly competitive market. We cannot ask locals in Bolivia and Peru, among others, to give up a highly profitable drug production growth for something that's less economically rewarding. That just invalidates economic rational thinking. So we'd have to help them along the way. But there's a major problem with subsidies. Not only do we not provide them significantly for foreign farmers, we do provide them for our own farmers. So we have poor countries in Latin America, very wealthy countries like the United States. We funnel enormous amounts of taxpayer dollars to our farmers. And when I say farmers, I don't mean mom and pop operations. I mean conglomerates with CEOs, lawyers, 
ad agencies in New York City and Houston and Los Angeles. They wear the $3,000 Italian suits. They probably wouldn't know one end of a shovel from another, but they're operating these massive farming industries. They have lobbyists that are very well paid on Wall Street and in Washington, D.C., and they're going to make sure that policies are going to be directed in the favor of their conglomerates, in the favor of their industries. So we pay farmers not to grow products. If they do grow them, we pay them not to sell them, and we pay them to store the products that they've grown that we're also paying them not to sell, both domestically and internationally. And what this does is it creates a very high profit margin for these conglomerate agricultural industries and allows them to sell their products both domestically and abroad very cheaply. In poor countries, where there isn't that enormous tax base to tap into, there aren't these sorts of subsidies. And what that means is that their farmers cannot compete. If we ask them to compete directly with us and our subsidies, they're going to migrate north. They're coming to the United States, or if they stay at home, they're going to turn to illegal drug production. They really don't have a lot of other options. So we're clamping down on migration, we're subsidizing our farmers, and we're somehow surprised that poor farmers in South America are growing coca and other illicit products. All right, if the source cannot be addressed, why don't we cut them off at the pass? Prevent those drugs from reaching the final destination. So let's take a look at how this works. There is the coca field. Inside of it, you've got the production, accumulation, and then initial transit to the production labs. We've already spoken of how the original point of production is very hard to get to. How about the production labs? Those are as well armed as any labs you'll find in the world. Premium grade A military force with the best weaponry that drug money can buy. It would be a war in those countries for the governments to go after the production labs. And of course, the way that it works is that if the military of, say, Mexico attacks a production lab for, for marijuana, those production labs, those criminal elements are not going to go to war with their own government and military. They're going to commit acts of terrorism and attack on innocent populations, knowing that the population will then pressure the government of Colombia, of Mexico, or one of the others to halt their war on drugs. So cutting them off there is also difficult. The weakest point in this delivery chain is with the transit of the runners. These are people that are delivering. They're sometimes called mules. They're delivering the drugs across international boundaries to hand off to a new set of runners. We can attack them pretty easily, and that's what we tend to focus upon. Low risk for us and local governments and a very high rate of success. The problem is that these runners are 14-year-olds. They're people who are very easily replaced. They are literally a dime a dozen in most of these countries. So as long as there are young people without jobs or futures, there will always be people to replace the runner that we just arrested and incarcerated. That certainly is not going to answer the question. So why don't we go to the real problem, which is the destination point, the demand side of the economic curve. Those drugs are produced and shipped to the United States for a singular reason. We are the market for them. We demand the drugs. We consume the drugs. We pay very high prices for those drugs. We can solve this problem with focusing on the United States. And what that means is that drug policy isn't just domestic and it's not just international. It is both of them at the same time. Our domestic policy is affected by our foreign drug policy, and our foreign policy is affected by our domestic drug policy. We call this issue intermestic. It's international and domestic at the same time, and it's one of the reasons there are 43 federal agencies and literally hundreds and thousands of state-level agencies involved in the drug policy. If we could succeed in dealing with the destination, American demand for drugs 
It would solve the transit route problem and the source problem. If there's not a profit to be made, these criminal organizations are not going to produce an illegal drug. If they do, it'll be for shipment to other places on the globe. So how do we curb demand? What do we do about America's seemingly insatiable appetite for illicit drugs? The spectrum is wide. We can go the hardline route of law and order, hiring more police, more border guards, more sea patrols, and building a lot more prisons. Or we can go to the other end of the spectrum, the soft line side, and legalize at least some drugs. Take the criminal element out of it, as proponents argue. Law and order, we've been trying that since the 1980s at a minimum. It was in the 1980s, Mr. Reagan said, we're going to go after drugs. Mrs. Reagan said, just say no. But the government decided to begin incarceration with mandatory sentencing for drug offenders. And just look at the population explosion among American prisoners. So we have the Nixon Declaration. We have the Reagan Sentencing Reform Act. Put those two together, and we don't have enough prisons to hold them all. There are very few countries in the world that incarcerate a higher percentage of their citizens than the United States. And we could continue this curve right out into 2022, and the numbers are up, up, and away. Now the major trend is private prisons. So we have, again, corporations with profit motive, high-paid lobbyists in Washington, directing resources to build private prisons who have an incentive to encourage the sort of domestic policies and laws and sentencing that will send more customers to them. And of course, by customer, I mean prisoners. So if law and order isn't working, how about legalization? There's a strong movement in this country, and many U.S. states now have legalized pot or marijuana. But this never works because you can't legalize cocaine. You can't legalize methamphetamine. You can't legalize so many of the, the very hard drugs, the dangerous killing drugs that are very popular in the United States. And even legalizing marijuana won't work. I mean, companies will make a profit and people will smoke, I guess you'd call it safe weed. But there's always going to be a demand for stronger marijuana, stronger beyond the, the, the envelope of what domestic law allows. And there will always be a demand for cheaper marijuana. Legalizing it raises the price. It must be regulated, inspected, taxed, and as a result of that, the price of marijuana goes up, and that means there's always a market for less expensive, i.e. illegal, marijuana being shipped in, including marijuana that is much, much stronger than what people can get through the legal resources. Legalization doesn't work. Law and order doesn't seem to work. But there's a whole array of options in between, both domestic and international. From a foreign policy point of view, if the United States is going to succeed, short of ending American demand for drugs, which no one sees happening in the future, we have to get along better with the governments of Latin America and the Caribbean. We need to build trust with Mexico first, because when there is something that happens across that border, and we want to send the FBI or other special agents over to investigate, we need the Mexicans to cooperate with us and to allow us access to those areas. And if we don't have good relations with them, and if we can't trust them, then we can't work with them. Mexico is the first point of focus, but it very quickly becomes all of Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. That is a very tall order, and one historically that we have not been terribly successful at. We have a poisoned relationship with Cuba, and many countries in Latin America refuse to work with us on important issues until we can get beyond the Cuban issue. Beyond that, there is the very chilly relationship we've historically had with Brazil, the largest and most influential country in the region. So rather than thinking of policy that includes all of Latin America and the Caribbean. We should focus on Mexico first, clean up our mess of a policy in Cuba, which serves no one's interest economically or politically, 
and then work very hard on a better relationship with Brazil. From there, we can branch out and perhaps have more success in heading off the illegal drugs that are entering this country. Solving the destination is first, but focusing on foreign policy and better relations certainly has to be part of the calculation. Thank you once again for attending this lecture as we move quickly towards the end of the 2022 series. Stay engaged and make great decisions. Well, that was quite an explanation. I think it was, um, well, he dealt with a lot of issues, but to break some of this down and to uh, make it even clearer for us, because it's pretty complex, is Dr. R. Evan Ellis. He is a research professor of Latin American studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. He has a focus on the region's relationships with China and other non-Western hemisphere actors, as well as transnational organized crime and populism in the region. I think we have the right person to talk today. But Dr. Ellis is prolific. I get every week, uh, I'm on his mailing list and he is writing every week some article and pretty in-depth and well-researched, I might add. But he has published over 300 works, including the 2009 book, China in Latin America, The What's and Wherefores. He also has a book published in 2013, The Strategic Dimension of Chinese Engagement with Latin America. And in 2014, China on the ground in Latin America. And 2018, Transnational Organized Crime in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now he's currently working on contract for his fifth book, China Engages Latin America, Distorting Development and Democracy. Well, Dr. Ellis, I can tell you, we are overjoyed to have you here to lead this conversation. So please, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's uh, good to see you again and be back here uh, in, in this forum. Uh, I appreciate the invitation and, and uh, certainly that, that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, also, uh, I thank uh, the group present uh, for your interest in, in these issues. It's uh, really an honor to be able to, to address the, the community of, of the uh, World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. Um, so uh, just a few things with respect to my ties to this issue I wanted to mention uh, before I uh, begin with some comment on, on the video that you just saw. Um, when I was uh, at what was called the William J. Perry Center from 2009 through 2014, uh, working directly with uh, ministries of defense uh, in the region. Uh, probably the key issue that we worked on was the, uh, the issues of, of transnational criminal groups and, and insecurity. And so I, I did have the opportunity to work with uh, a number of, of different uh, partners uh, in the region. Uh, in addition to that, of course, uh, you know, a lot of those experiences were the basis of my 2018 book on transnational organized crime uh, in the region. Um, and uh, that led me also to have the opportunity to uh, serve on uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo's policy planning staff uh, for a year from uh, 2019 to 2020. Um, in addition to my response responsibility for uh, WHA, Western Hemisphere uh, Affairs. Uh, I also had responsibility to oversee um, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, I INL. And so um, I, well, I want to emphasize that um, I will express my personal opinions. These do not in any way uh, represent the opinion of, of the U.S. government, uh, either currently or, or, in, or in the past. Um, but uh, I, I would like to uh, comment based on some of my experiences in, in the region. And again, um, I want to start out just with, with a few reactions, uh, you know, both positive and negative to what you just saw based on that experience. And I'm going to kind of go in the order that I, the video presented things. And so, um, first of all, the question of how is policy made and, and how does that impact the decisions? Um, my own personal experience, again, overseeing INL and seeing how INL interfaced with DEA and other entities, uh, seeing also you know, how um, you know, our security assistance programs and, and other uh, entities uh, tied into that. Um, my sense is that um, oftentimes we overcomplicate these things, that in reality, when we look at policies, uh, certainly uh, each individual president or administration brings their ideas of the trade-offs there. Um, generally, the bureaucracies that I've had the honor to work with are, are faithful to at least trying to implement the direction of that administration. We certainly see how different administrations have different people and push that in different directions. Um, and certainly there is some uh, you know, gamesmanship between uh, different entities, INL, DEA. Um, but 
there's generally an attempt that we're all on the same team, um, that we're trying to do things in a positive way, um, different organization, see things in a different way. Um, but I, I think a lot of those things tend to be frictions. And so I don't want to overplay the element of it's all just, you know, chaos and organizations fighting and, and losing track of, of what we're fighting over. Um, in addition to that, when we talk about working with our partners, and, and frankly, Latin America is one of the places where our work on these issues, uh, especially drug issues, but, but also other security issues, is one of the most fundamental part of of our security relationships. Um, and certainly with drug issues, one of the things that uh, does impair is um, the question of politics. In some cases, it's politics with a big P. Uh, for example, the way in which uh, Venezuela and Bolivia and, and other what you'd call you know, anti-US populist regimes um, have eliminated um, entities like the DEA and our ability to do those types of cooperation with them, sometimes to protect drug operations that are tied with the governments. In other cases where governments would uh, very overtly uh, work with us, for example, Juan Orlando Hernandez in, in Honduras, the previous president, and yet it was clear that um, you know, the governments themselves were involved with narco trafficking. And so um, sometimes there would be important limits on the protection, even when we would see it in other areas. And other areas where just because of political sensitivities and maybe some protections, for example, Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador right now in Mexico, um, where they passed a, a new national security law, which made it very difficult to work, for example, um, you know, the DEA to interface with its uh, local uh, counterparts in, in Mexico. So the question was, um, okay, is that because of historical Mexican sensitivities over um, you know, U.S. government overreach in Mexico, or is it because uh, AMLO is trying to protect, for example, the Sinaloa cartel, which uh, you know some people believed, or, or is it some combination of, of both? But um, you know, there are a range of, of different reasons why there are difficulties in those relationships, and yet at the same time, we also tend to have, in some areas, some very good cooperation with Latin American governments on, on these issues as well. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, also, important when you saw those maps, um, and, and certainly we often focus on the, the drugs coming to the United States. And so you saw that wonderful map of the drugs coming out of Colombia, working their way up either through the Caribbean or Central America, through Mexico to, to the United States. Um, but thinking about the well-being of, of Latin America, it's very important to recall that, for example, a lot of those drugs, uh, especially today that are produced in, in Peru, um, especially in areas such as the Apuramec Eni and, and Montado River Valleys, the famous brine, as well as some in Bolivia, um, those often flow uh, down uh, through Argentina uh, to ports like Buenos Aires or Rosario, Montevideo, where they go over to Europe. Um, some of the drugs that come out of Colombia also flow uh, from places like the, um, the Gulf of Paria um, in Trinidad and Tobago and go also over to Europe. Um, so often Sometimes we forget um, the way in which it's not all about us, but those drug flows um, also are impacting, um, are going in other directions, impacting other, other nations. Um, and indeed, one of the things that you find through uh, what's called payment in kind, which has been going on for years, where instead of paying in dollars or other local currency, the narco traffickers would pay um, in whatever they're moving, generally cocaine. And that uh, led to a emerging demand in many places where there previously was not that much demand. And so, for example, in some of the, the slums of, of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo and places like that in, in Brazil. Um, what we used to call crack cocaine, the Brazilians call uh, bazooko. Uh, in Argentina, Buenos Aires, they, they, they call it paco. And so important to understand that not only the, the flows and the violence and the money, these are impacting the entire region. And it's not just all about the, the U.S. demand. Um, beyond that, um, uh, important point about the, the United States. You saw that wonderful uh, uh, illustration of the highway networks and 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 that um, Mexican cartels like Sinaloa, Jalisco, Nueva Generación oftentimes work with gangs in the United States who have some affiliation with them. So it's not all just on the Mexican side. It doesn't suddenly become safe when we get to the United States. Um, on the East Coast, uh, for example, a lot of the expansion of opioids, if you remember back a couple of years ago, um, that was initially through many of the Dominican gangs that had been uh, well inserted um, within uh, the East Coast. And so you find in different parts of the United States, you have different local gangs. Um, that are the basically the distributors that are tied to those who are moving the drugs. And so it's, it's a very complex picture and important to understand that, that we here in the United States are, are part of those networks on, on the distribution side. Um, also, I think it's important to point out that when we talk about drugs, um, there is a tendency to talk about cocaine, and we tend to default to thinking about the cocaine supply chain. But every single supply chain is different in terms of where things are produced, where things move, how they move, the technical considerations. So, for example, 
um, you have opioids. So when we had with OxyContin and basically the, the rediscovering of you know, basically opioids or heroin as substitutes for OxyContin, um, there, is an or, there is a part of, of Mexico that a lot of that historically was, was produced in places like Sinaloa that became one of the new source zones. There's also a place uh, near San Marcos in, in Guatemala where a lot of that came from. It's not just the old kind of the Asian uh, heroin triangle. Or for example, when we talk about fentanyl, a lot of fentanyl, as well as other synthetic drugs, is not necessarily produced. You don't grow fentanyl, although sometimes fentanyl is used to lace other things. Um, but for example, a lot of that fentanyl was actually uh, produced in China, initially mailed directly to the United States. Uh, and also when we began to clamp down on the mail and push back with our, our Chinese counterparts to help us control that, um, a lot began to uh, come into Mexico and through the cartels, it was produced or cut with other things and came up through there. So so every supply chain is, is different, but it, it's easy to focus on Colombia and, and labs and, and things like that. Um, beyond that, just when we talk about the, the cocaine chain, because it is, uh, we typically do fly over this, um, a couple of things uh, just I think are important to, to maybe uh, correct. Um, number one, when we talk about aerial eradication, um, number one, we, the United States, do not fly the planes. Um, it is almost always by our, our partner companies countries. Um, and if there's ever any U.S. role, it is fully with the approval of those partner countries. Indeed, one of the reasons that Colombia had to stop its aerial eradication program was because its Supreme Court um, had some concerns about the some of the impacts of um, the chemicals that were used. Um, but this, these are not the chemicals that were used in Vietnam for defoliation. Um, this is actually um, chemically, uh, it's called glyphosate. Um, it is That's the most common one. It is uh, roughly a um, consistent with what Monsanto uses, what you use in your, your gardens uh, uh, called, called Roundup. You, you may have heard of it commercially. And so um, although there are some concerns about the long run effects of, of spraying, um, spraying things do not you know, kill people in mass numbers. Um, so that's a, a misnomer. Also, it's important to recognize that aerial eradication is far, far more efficient and less dangerous for our partners um, and, and others than aerial. Why is that? Um, number one, because when you can fly over, although you occasionally have people to try to shoot at you, and we actually have had um, some instances of, of, of downed planes over the years with, with our partners. Um, when you go manual eradication, you're basically going into places where people in remote areas are earning a livelihood from these illegal crops and saying, we're gonna come in here and we are going to rip out or burn your, your crops in, in front of you. So as you might expect, there's a little bit of local resistance. And so oftentimes you have to dedicate um, military manpower or other to basically guard the people who are ripping out the crops. So very large manual effort, very large um, uh, effort. Um, oftentimes it helps to produce and, and, and augment uh, basically social tensions and, and violence in the areas where you're trying to do the, the eradication. Although, for example, our Colombian partners have made heroic efforts to to, to do that. Um, a comment also on, on the, uh, the crop substitution part. Um, so Absolutely uh, correct that one of the difficulties of our crop substitution programs in places like, like Columbia is we have historically underfunded those crop substitution programs. Um, so we say, you know, for example, we had signed contracts in Columbia right after the Columbia 2016 peace accord um, with about uh, with about 70,000 different families in Columbia um, to help uh, alternatives, um, the actual funding that we put into the program didn't even cover 10,000. And frankly, it was probably the wrong 10,000 know, people. In addition, um, the problems are oftentimes um, that there is not the infrastructure available. And so if you want to get your, um, you know, you get cocoa, well, the narcos will come and, and they'll pick up your cocoa for you. You just have to, to grow it. Um, if you want to do bananas or rice or, or things like that, um, you know, you have to get the road to get to market. You have to have a local demand for that product. You have to have the knowledge to do that. And oftentimes we're real good at saying, you know, here, here's some seeds, plant some plants. Um, but we also forget that um, when those local farmers in remote areas um, stop growing the cocoa and the narcos show up, and, and say, hey, where's our crop? Oh, we decided we we're going to uh, grow bananas. Um, you know, the government is not always there when those very displeased uh, narcos uh, are looking at the people who are now telling them we didn't grow your cocoa this year. So there's lots of different reasons why crop substitution is really difficult. Um, I would take strong issue, however, with the idea that U.S. agricultural subsidies on things like soy and wheat uh, impact that, because traditionally the alternative crops are ten, uh, things that are, are locally uh, relevant. Uh, again, they, they may 
may be fruits, they may be coffee and, and things like that. Um, but generally, those do not directly compete with U.S. agricultural uh, goods. So that was a, a bit of a misnomer. Um, also, another comment on interdicting labs. Um, our Latin American counterparts oftentimes, with our help, interdict labs all the time. Uh, yes, those labs are protected. Yes, it can create a situation of, of violence. Um, but typically, um, you know, there are certain guerrilla groups in remote areas, uh, of course, famously in Colombia, the Forces Armadas Revolucionarios de, de Colombia, um, that you know will be involved in, in helping to kind of protect the area where labs are, and so that creates certain hazards. Um, but number one, the groups do not, um, you know, basically, you know, fight to the death over their labs. They they usually run when when the military comes in to take out the labs, um, or you know, if there's a fight, it's because they're surprised and, and something like that. Um, number two, the um, narco's do not attack the local populations in order to put pressure against the local on local populations to protect their labs. Um, you know, there tends to be a mutual relationship of of, of benefit and, and things like that. Um, but typically, the narco terrorism is against those who are are not cooperating with them in one way or, 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 or another. Um, beyond that, uh, also when you talk about interdiction, um, uh, the, the comment about runners, um, typically the in, there are in certain places, so for example, you know, how do you get, for example, um, refined cocaine out of remote jungle regions in Peru? Well, you do use what they call mulas, or basically people who put it on backpacks and things like that, and you know, walk long distances, uh, you know, foot traffic. Um, you do oftentimes also um, sometimes use people, uh, sometimes who who ingest or, or otherwise, um, you know, hide uh, uh, drugs on, on their bodies to, to go to go through. Um, but the vast majority of the transport is done by other ways. And so you you hide drugs in hidden containers of, of cars or other vehicles. Um, of course, you you bribe people so that the scanners are turned off when you go through those road checkpoints. Um, increasingly, as as the the video pointed out, um, you know with attempts at territorial control, you've seen um, a shift to uh, much more use of sea routes, and so the construction of narco subs in places like the mangrove swamps of southwest Colombia, um, in places like Tumaco or the north of, of Ecuador, that uh, then will go up to the Guatemalan coast, the Mexican coast, and will then land and, and continue there. Uh, in some cases, you have the use of, um, of uh, towed buoys uh, and, and other things. You have a low observable boats that will leave uh, either Colombia, the Gulf of Uraba, or Venezuela that will go up to Hispaniola, typically the Dominican Republic, um, and then from there it will be warehoused for a while, and, and then either we'll go over to Europe or we'll go over to Guatemala or, or up to the United States. Um, but there's lots of different vehicles and technologies that are involved um, with, with that movement, uh, just to kind of you know, spell that out a little bit. Um, and also when we talk about uh, destinations, I think it's, it's really important to emphasize that there are other sources of demand, as I noted, other than you know, just the United States, although certainly U.S. demand is important. Um, and again, there are other crimes that uh, transnational groups, uh, typically some groups are more involved in cocaine or, or other drug movements. Other groups are involved in illegal mining. Other groups are involved in uh, human smuggling or extortion. Uh, it really depends on, on the nature of the groups. And sometimes groups shift from one revenue earning thing, thing to another. And so just to kind of, it's not quite as simple as the bad guys just produce and, and move drugs. Um, now, to talk about demand a little bit, um, and I think one thing that's very, very important to to point out, because uh, the idea of, well, you know, the U.S. is the source of, of demand, and if we just solved that, that must be a really easy thing, um, all the problems would go away. Well, first of all, um, eliminating demand is really hard. You have, you know, issues of, you know, how do you get people who are addicted to not be addicted? How do you provide social alternatives to those people who maybe have been in jail or are trying to overcome addiction problems? Um, how do you um, uh, create uh, other alternatives uh, for for, for, for those people. Um, how do you, um, you know, and there's a whole range and the amount, frankly, the amount of money that you have to spend on um, addiction treatment and, you know, social remedies to addicted populations and other things and education, um, the amount of money is far, far, far greater for the net dent that you get in the result and oftentimes it takes far longer than interdiction. Now, obviously you have to do a little bit of, of everything with an intelligent policy, um, but um, oftentimes the most expensive policy to get results actually is reducing demand. And, and oh, by the way, as we'll talk about on the Biden administration side, we actually do spend a lot of money on demand reduction right now. And as a matter of fact, of the Biden administration's current focus, six of the seven current pillars of the Biden administration drug policies are focused on dealing with U.S. demand and dealing with the social consequences of or other consequences of addicted populations. So sometimes that's a, that's a big misnomer. Um, 
a quick uh, comment also on legalization. Um, also, um, it's important to, to remember that, and I think there were some good points made by the 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 uh, the speaker but in addition to the difficulty of reducing demand we have to understand that if you make certain things legal um it make means that organizations involved in transporting them then have greater options for laundering money because now what was previously illegal now becomes a legal source of of income and helps them actually to hide their cash if they stay in one way or another in that industry um it is correct to say that it's very difficult to talk about legalizing uh, more ad highly addictive, more highly lethal drugs, you know, certainly things like fentanyl or, or cocaine or, or, or heroin. Uh, and indeed, you see in, in Europe, the size of the addict populations, even where those things are, are legalized, grows enormously, and they spend a lot of money to, to deal with, with those issues. Um, and also, there's always the risk of the question, I think it's debatable, and some people come down on each side of this, is the question of to what degree are certain types of drugs like marijuana or, for that matter, alcohol, are are these gateway drugs, and so you know, if you legalize one, uh, how you know what do you legalize, what you don't. Um, and as the video properly pointed out, um, talked a little bit about you know, people always want more, but as we actually will see in the Uruguay example, one of the problems is that uh, you always get a black market in the drugs that you even legalize, and empirically we, we see that across the region. Uh, and then uh, finally, just a couple of final comments. Um, I, I think um, number one, um, in my personal opinion, Cuba is absolutely not the problem for drugs. Um, there are virtually no countries in, in Latin America that do not do security cooperation with us um, you know, because of our position on, on Cuba. Um, and, and again, I worked at you know, WHA and, and I can tell you it just isn't the case. There are areas where our broader policy points and, and the orientation of our partner governments um, may mean that they are reluctant to work with us in one way or another. Um, but um, I, there are zero governments that I have seen that do not work with us on drugs because specifically of Cuba. Also, ironically, um, number one, our relations with, with, with the Brazil have been fairly positive. Certainly, we were very positive under the previous administration, a little bit less so now because of, of differences in opinion um, with um, between the Biden administration and, and Jair Bolsonaro over things like uh, the, the Amazon and, and, and stewardship of, of the Amazon. Um, but ironically, um, Brazil, as we just talked about, is not actually part of of the drug production chain that goes to the United States. And so while it's important to work with Brazil in other areas in terms of Latin American security issues and actually be very concerned because Brazil is impacted because Brazilian gangs like the First Capital Command are actually involved in the drug production chains that flow from Peru and Bolivia um, to the southeast of Brazil, places like Rio and Sao Paulo and on, on to Europe. Um, but, um, but having a good relationship with Brazil, which is absolutely important, um, is only marginally related to our particular drug production problem. Now, since I've already taken a lot of time with this, I'm going to go very, very quickly just through a few slides. I'm, I'm not going to have time to, to go into detail, um, but uh, certainly the slides uh, are, are available for, for the group. Um, so uh, with uh, my apologies for the rapidity with which I'm going to go th go through this. Uh, I just wanted to say, just highlight a few um, few points. And you should now be able to see a U.S. drug policy in Latin America. Uh, please note that my contact information is is there. So uh, for those of you who would like to reach out afterwards and, and be on my my distro list for my occasional publications. Um, and again, I've uh, gone through a whole detail on the historical perspective, um, just to remind us that um, this has evolved over the years, and, and we could see, again, not only the, the Nixon administration war on drugs and the Reagan administration uh, stepping up, the era that we probably re you know remember is, is the Miami Vice era, but the continuation, the continuation dur during the Clinton era, um, each a little bit different. But understanding that the relationship between, um, between our U.S. drug policy and what was actually happening in the region. And again, I'm not going to have time to go into all of the detail here, but but just by way of commenting that what was happening in the region affected um, the United States. And so, for example, when they took down Pablo Escobar um, in, in because the Colombians used to have a big piece of the international organization of the, the narco trade. Um, when they took down uh, Escobar and later they took down the Cali cartel in, in about 96, um, you then had the rise of the Mexican cartels increasingly important. Um, and again, as we've uh, be, begun, especially under the Felipe Calderon era, the war uh, against the Mexican cartels, you had the fragmentation of, of those cartels. You begin to see also changes in other patterns. And you've had changes in patterns in, for example, the intermediary 
territories and places like Guatemala and Honduras uh, groups, such as the um, in, in Honduras, it was uh, the Cachiros and the Valle Valles. In Guatemala, it was the Lorenzanas and the Lopez Ortiz family and, and others. But just constantly um, you know, shifting relationships. Relationships actually that shifted as well when borders were shut down and, and, and uh, things uh, during, during the COVID crisis. Again, very uh, rapidly, um, we've seen, uh, of course, uh, that over the years, um, the actual efforts that went into the U.S. interdiction response were actually very limited. There's often a misnomer that we're spending all of this effort on a militarized. Um, but if you look at the um, very small um, you know, Plan Merida, which was focused on helping our Mexican counterparts with security. And oh, by the way, the Mexicans did the vast majority of those things. The Mexicans, with their own money, for example, were fighting their own uh, drug cartel challenges, um, bought about $1.4 billion in, in, in U.S. equipment, Humvees and, and Black Hat helicopters and, and, and things like that. Very, very little um, did we actually provide to them. The same thing with uh, the, the, um, the Central American Regional Security Initiative, or, or CARC. Um, we over the years provided, um, you know, again, it was, it was about 750 million um, under the Obama administration, but it was relatively limited, uh, small relative to, to other efforts. And of course, in the Caribbean, the, the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, which has been going on for a little over a decade now, again, very, very minor amount of money, but uh, the Coast Guard and others do a lot of good work uh, for there. Now, especially working with regional partners, uh, not only on interdiction, but also building up partner law enforcement capabilities so that they can better deal with those those drug flows uh, in you know that are affecting their own countries um we've seen a little bit about legalization as i talked to before i think it's important to, to note that in countries where you've had legalization like uruguay and jamaica you have still had a black market in, in some of those drugs um with respect to the current situation, again, as I alluded to before, um, one of the big things that happened in Colombia, which is the major source on country for the United States, is that when Colombia did its peace deal with the uh, First Armados Revolucionarios de Colombia, the FARC, back in 2016, um, it arguably had a lot of flaws. And one of the big things that happened is that the Colombians um, basically, they had, um, they, they, um, they, um, stepped back on a lot of, of eradication programs. They, around the same time, they, they stopped aerial eradication. Um, they, um, because a, a lot of the people who were in the areas that the FARC were going out of were encouraged to start growing um, more cocaine or more cocoa in anticipation of uh, basically being compensated under these crop substitution programs. You actually have, saw that during the peace deal, um, the growing of coca, which had been actually decreased uh, down to about 40,000 hectares, um, actually multiplied more than fivefold to 209,000 hectares. Um, and again, we're still trying to deal with that today, largely through uh, manual uh, eradication. And that has just pumped a lot more drug money in, into uh, Colombia. Um, uh, another thing I should just emphasize here in, in Venezuela, um, the way in which uh, basically the criminalization of the Venezuelan government of, of uh, Nicolas Maduro um, and their active involvement um, in basically the drugs flowing through the country has shifted some of the patterns. A lot of the drugs that used to come out of Colombia now come out of Venezuela, um, and you see that the, that um, that uh, you know that active role of, of Maduro administration um, has you know, impacted drug flows uh, through through the rest of the region. The um, uh, of course, uh, with uh, COVID-19, as I indicated before, you had a lot of things that made our, the situation harder. So with increases in poverty, you have more desperate people in the region, more people in the informal sector. That means that you have more people who are willing to participate in operations like the unloading or loading of, of drugs in remote places like the Mesquite in Honduras. You have people who are willing to use their own bank accounts or the bank accounts of their businesses to help uh, launder money for the drug organizations um, or, or do uh, other types of things. Um, the informal sector, because a lot of people who were in formal jobs with small businesses lost their small businesses. And so that means that the size of, of the sector, which is cash based and with not, you know, physical records in, in Latin America, dramatically increased, which makes it even harder to go after the money of, of these uh, organizations. As I indicated, there were changes in relationships. There were changes in techniques. You started seeing bigger shipments, more use of private aircraft and yachts and, and things like that. And even technology like, like UAVs, which are not really used to move drugs so much, is they're used to basically see when all is clear on the border in order to, um, in order to move a shipment across the border, among other things. So again, uh, just to come back Back to the Biden administration, I think it's important to emphasize on, on the fact that, as I indicated before, um, uh, with the current Office of National Drug Control Policy, six out of seven of the pillars of the current administration's program 
are focused on demand reduction. Again, number one, it, treatment of addiction. Number two, uh, addressing some of the racial differences, the, the way in which uh, Afro-American communities especially have been disproportionately targeted for tr uh, criminalization, um, both getting involved in, in the, um, the, the drug culture as well as the, the associated uh, incarceration over the years. Uh, number three, uh, looking at what they call harm reduction. So for example, uh, more availability of, of drugs such as Naxalone so that people who overdose especially um, you know, basically do not die from those overdoses. Uh, uh, prevent, again, more prevention programs. Um, again, number five, supply reduction is all of those other things that we talk about. Um, there are things like employability of addicts. And so, you know, if you're an addict, you know, how are you going to get a job so you can break that cycle? Um, and, and again, um, you know, how do you get recovery services so that you can, once you get off of these very addictive drugs, how do you, how do you stay off of it? Um, and again, the, um, again, $44 billion in programs. So of those programs, only a very, very small percentage is actually um, working uh, interdiction and supply side uh, things. Um, and again, multiple different agencies who are working. And again, when you think of, uh, well, 43 agencies involved in, in, in drugs, you think, well, they're all involved in interdiction. Well, no, a lot of them are actually involved in working with you know, communities in the US, um, preventing overdoses and things like that. And, and, and even the Centers for Disease Control um, has a role, but primarily focus on, on, on education of um, against uh, drugs as a, um, is again, as a basically a disease. Um, and again, just to throw a few final points out there uh, to stimulate discussion, uh, as we alluded to before, there's a real debate over some of the undesirable effects of, of legalization in terms of, of increasing addiction, increasing criminality. Um, you know, the role of, of some drugs potentially is, is a gateway drug, the way in which, uh, you know, legalization may not actually fully eliminate the earnings of drug trafficking organizations um, because they will continue to use that, but they then they will just be able to uh, now be involved in a legal activity that they will be able to, to use to hide their illicit activities. Um, as we saw in Uruguay, the persistence of a black market, um, the um, the fact that uh, you, you do indeed, um, you get a problem when you have some drugs that are legal, some drugs that are illegal, some drugs that are legal in some states. I mean, marijuana is a case of this. And so in some places, you have to have a prescription for medical marijuana. In other cases, it's more fully legal. Um, so if you can imagine the nightmare that this creates for law enforcement um, and organizations um, trying to make sure that when you try to go after what is illegal, when it's partially illegal, legal in different jurisdictions in, in different ways. It just creates a, a nightmare for, for trying to, to address that problem. And also the question of if you do legalization, who benefits from legalization and who doesn't? The question of, you know, to the extent that legalization in the United States, um, you know, will that actually decrease violence in Latin America? Will that actually um, lower the economic benefit that is going to the Latin American uh, part of, of the drug supply chain? So ironically, um, will you actually um, decrease the amount of money that is available for those who you know grow coca in places like the highlands of Peru, um, and thus at the end of the day um, contribute to to other problems. And so um, again, um, I think it's it's an interesting debate, but um, I think there's there's a complexity that needs to be understood with that. And so uh, with that, I uh, will stop my my formal remarks and look forward to the discussion of, of the group. So thanks a lot for for your time, and I'm looking forward to uh, our, our discussion. Well, wonderful. This has been most thorough, but you've only made it more complex with what you presented. <laughs> but but that, we do have several questions here, but I'm, I'm still confused a little bit with regard to the black market. I mean, just as a normal person, you think, well, now it's free. You can use it. The people who are sick will have a place to treat you. But you're saying that they're still going to be the illegal side of this. What would be illegal if everything's illegal? I mean, why would there be a black market? And, and let me start out. Um, there's a black market for just about everything. I mean, there's a black market for designer clothing, for example. I mean, the, the Chinese knockoffs that come in, um, you know, that, you know, you have a black market for, you know, tobacco products. And so what, what happened in Uruguay, for, for example, and I worked at Uruguay case, so I have more direct familiarity with that, um, is again, the Uruguayans wanted to regulate it and say, okay, so it has to be produced here in Uruguay uh, under, uh, it, was, it was similar to what the, the, the gentleman in, in the program uh, suggested. Um, okay, it has to be produced here in Uruguay under certain regulated conditions, you know, with basically those who are growing it, um, you know, subject to, you know, appropriate agricultural conditions, not exploitative. Um, it's going to be sold through, um, you know, 
these basically pharmacies. Um, so the problem was that the big producer of, of marijuana in South America is actually in the east of Paraguay. And so, um, you know, the Paraguayans who were doing it illegally didn't have to do all of these. Um, you know, is it, you know, is it, is it, is it, is it produced under, you know, socially just conditions with inspected yeah. agricultural facilities? So you can still do it cheaply. And so you wanted basically more potent marijuana that was basically cheaper. Um, so basically, and so the problem was that the people you could not, it was really hard to prove that the marijuana that you were using um, was, you know, legally sourced Uruguayan marijuana as opposed to Paraguayan marijuana that you got more, more cheaply. So that was, the, so it actually, sub, it, it substituted one problem for, for another problem. Is, but but, but um, was the new problem more manageable than the old problem? Or was it just as bad? Yeah. Well, I would say it was a different problem because the idea with legalizing marijuana was okay. You you know you had law enforcement incarcerating people for something that you know public policy we say is is not that bad of a thing. And so let's let's you know eliminate the overhead for for that. The new problem was it was a different problem because now it was. You had an, an illegal activity taking place, um, basically black market marijuana that was really difficult, and you, you had to spend a lot of law enforcement time if you if you wanted to stop this from happening. And in in reality, law enforcement has found it almost an impossible problem to to stop these flows. But now you have this basically the legal market has actually increased, has actually benefited the illegal traffickers um, in Paraguay and the illegal you know market in a way that's almost impossible for law enforcement to. To, to combat. And so the benefit, okay, so you've got fewer people in jail for marijuana related crimes. On the other hand, you have a bigger illegal industry um, that is very difficult for, for law enforcement to, to combat. Does, does that illegal industry lead to a higher crime rate, lead to more violent crime? You know what I'm saying? Okay, so you've got this problem here. But have well, you reduced the murders, the all the assaults, all of that, that we associate often with drug activity? You know? And, and that's and that's a great question. And it's actually a more difficult question because um again, in the Uruguayan case, because it's I don't say just marijuana, which is not um a highly addictive substance, at least according to most. Um it, it, you know, so the question is, you know, do you have an increase in crimes of, of people, you know, who are going and marijuana is, is relative to things like like cocaine or, or highly addictive things like, you know, especially the crack variant of cocaine, um, not that expensive. I mean, you know, comparable to, for example, alcohol, which is actually much more addictive. And so, um, you know. I know, I know. So you say, well, what crimes have been? So the crime that was done away with was the, basically the crime of putting in people in jail for using illegal substance. So was that actually? Do you actually have less crime, or you know, you certainly have less people in jail now over over marijuana? But how did that change the incidence of other crimes? So I think you could you could make the case that um, it really didn't impact um, crimes associated with you know people who robbed or steal stole or did other things because they, they wanted that that fix. Um, but what it did did is it is it increased a criminal network um, that previously wasn't quite as powerful. Um, these issues are, are complicated and it's yeah every single type of drug has has a different dynamic with, with that you know with that type right. of thing. Right. Well this, this is this is truly fascinating but here's a question we often focus on the corruption of some of the source or transit states, but what about our own drug interdiction authorities? The reader asks, who's watching our teams and how often does corruption arise among them? That's a great question. And and absolutely within US law enforcement and, and you know US politics, there is narco-related corruption. Um, it is arguably somewhat less uh, than in, in some other places. Number one, because um, we have a tradition of relatively strong and effective institutions. And so, you know, when there's a high probability of, of getting caught and also, again, you know, we have institutionalized things with technology and resources to do them. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, polygraph tests for law enforcement personnel that are actually funded and done on a regular basis, ways in a, an economy that has a relatively small informal sector like, like the U.S. Um, if you're all of a sudden making a lot of money, um, you know, we have ways of saying, okay, we do periodic lifestyle checks of, of law enforcement personnel now. So if you're suddenly, you know, buying yachts and things that are a lot easier to, to hide in, in Latin America, it's easier to get caught. And so absolutely there is corruption. Um, it, 
is a little bit more controlled, but but it certainly uh, but it certainly is a but it certainly is a problem in, in the United States as well. Okay, there's a question related to China. Given it's saying, given its growing investment and diplomatic presence in Latin America, what role, if any, has China played in anti-drug enforcement efforts there? Well, first of all, um, I uh, again, when I was uh, overseeing INL, um, I we uh, China does cooperate with us on on drugs, um, not perfectly because they you know prefer not to you kind of open up the hood of their car, if you will, to let us see all that's going on, um, you know, with their own dirty laundry and, and their own law enforcement dynamics. Oftentimes, because of what they perceive as security or, or intelligence, uh, you know, reasons. Um, the Chinese generally do cooperate to some degree. They're not a rogue state in that sense. Um, when we put a lot of pressure with respect to uh, precursor chemicals like um, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, which are used to make uh, methamphetamines, for, for example, um, you know, they did some cooperation with us on that. Um, when we were, uh, you know, had issues with basically the, the mass mailing of fentanyl from unregulated labs in, in Wuhan, China, again, they worked to help us out with that. Now, ironically, that meant that those unregulated labs started, you know, sending the sending it to um, you know, places, for example, in, in, in Mexico, and then we had a different uh, type of problem. But again, there is some cooperation, but at the same time, not as much as there probably should or could be. And certainly given the um, the lethality of fentanyl, which is not only used directly, but again, because of, of the risk that a small difference in, in, in dosage can kill you. I mean, fentanyl deaths are a big portion of the 102,000, I think, deaths we had last year from, from overdoses. And, and again, it gets laced into opioids, it gets laced into cocaine, it even gets laced into to, to, to marijuana. And so um, China is a big source of the problem. And so it would be important to have more cooperation even than the you know modest cooperation, I, I would say, that we actually do get from Chinese authorities. Because they're profiting from it. The Chinese are profiting from it. So no? The Chinese, like like when their companies um, do other things where they get involved in cutting corners on, on labor and the, and the projects that they do in Latin America or environmental regulations, um, the Chinese have laws in the books, um, and sometimes they enforce the laws when it makes their government look bad. But if it's going to hurt a company or other things, they're oftentimes not in a hurry to enforce their laws uh, abroad. And so um, to the extent that it makes them look bad, they 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 do work with us and they certainly don't want to be perceived as not working with us but um you know it is it, and it's not that it undercuts the profits of their companies because their petrochemical companies and, and other companies really aren't that big of a part of, of their economy um they're just they they do the minimum that they need to 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 be seen as cooperating um, I, i'll put it that way right um i want to delve a little bit more to into the subsidizing and why that isn't working and you know i it, they made a very good case and i get it having lived abroad and been to many of these countries that uh, that people are poor they have to have something this is a way that they can feed their families or more or or have some decent life so you would think the economic angle is definitely you know a factor in all of this and yet, it does, as you point out, and I think that the, the other speaker did too, we're, we, we haven't put enough money in it. What if that were changed? What do you think? And I know you also mentioned, but the drug kingpins aren't going to be happy about it. But what if we did say, we know how much we're spending, how much this is costing our economy, and we can't even calculate how much it's costing. What if we really gave this subsidy stuff what it needed to work? That's a great question. Um, and I think there's a certain logic, um, and, and I'm a big proponent that we need to be spending a whole lot more than we, we currently are in the region with which we are intimately connected by ties of, of family as, as well as ties of, of commerce and ties of geography. And we see that when things go bad in, in Latin America, it becomes a domestic challenge for us through immigration and, of course, through drugs and, and other things. Um, that oftentimes we talk about you know, if we could just throw enough money at it. And I, I want to put the example of Afghanistan out there because at, with the war on drugs, I think there was a moment of just blind faith in our ability to completely fix a country that we know very little about. And so, you know, after literally trillions of dollars of, of spending in Afghanistan over you know many, many, many years, um, you know, we walked away and, and look how quickly you know that regime collapsed and, and now the Taliban. And so I think we oftentimes think if we just throw enough money at it, um, the problems will be fixed. And it is, again, as is, is I think uh, the Biden administration, Vice President Harris is finding right now with the focus on, on root causes, um, the, you know, 
where do you put the money and, and how do you create opportunities and do you have a willing partner and how do you make sure that that money isn't just, you know, essentially, you know, stolen or goes into bad idea projects? Um, and what is the delay between, you know, how do you solve the security situation so that the money goes in actually produces enduring change? Um, and if you produce enduring change that begin to give people other things to do, it's not just, okay, well, I the vast majority of people in Latin America of, of all socioeconomic walks of life, all those, there's the acceptance of, of corruption, just people learn to live with corruption, people uh, you know, learn to live with certain double standards. Um, but in general, most people that I've worked with over the years in Latin America, you know, don't just say, okay, I just want to do bad things. I, um, you know, even in the poorest of neighborhoods and, and I have, you know, personal friends, um, you know, you know, mothers try to teach their kids, you know, don't get involved with the pandillas, don't get involved with this, don't get involved with the, with the drug trafficking. Um, but it happens. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, even if you start producing other jobs and other other things, well, you know, there are still the people with the flashy, you know, watches and the nice cars and they get the girls and things like that. And so we're talking generate. I mean, even in the United States, and and so it's it's generations of providing economic alternatives and, and things like that and changing attitudes um, to make even somewhat of a dent in it. So I think that's part of it, but it's not the it's not the the only thing. But but certainly there's a lot more that we can and and should be. Doing Doing. Um, and frankly, we have to do it in a smart way because it's not just because if you just say, okay, I'm going to throw money at my pet program and we're going to build more, you know, bridges and we're going to give more money to, um, you know, to, to certain communities that suddenly we'll stop having drugs flow through the region and suddenly we're, um, you know, it's, you've got to do those things. You've got to do them intelligently. Frankly, in terms of our own economic infrastructure and, and inequalities and things, there's a heck of a lot more that we need to do to, to fix our own problems. Um, you know, it's, so our difficulties in throwing money to fix our own problems show you how difficult it is to, to deal with the very intractable problems that we have in, in, in our neighbor. So absolutely need more money, absolutely have to do it, but um, realize that that's only one small piece of the problem and it's gonna take years for things to get better. I see. Well, before I ask you and get ready for what is the solution, before I, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question here because it's an interesting one. How successfully can drug money be tra tracked and seized from banks um, in the U.S. or anywhere? I mean, uh, or in, and are any major U.S. banks involved in laundering these proceeds? Question. Um, and there is a lot of stuff, and, and frankly, um, focusing on, on the money is, is probably one of the least glamorous and sexy parts, but probably one of the most important parts of, of our efforts. Um, it's my, my a dear colleague of mine, Selena Riulio, uh, uh, always said, you know, follow the money. I mean, because without money, narco trafficking organizations, um, you know, they they everything falls apart. The ability to bribe, the ability to acquire arms, the ability to, to acquire production infrastructure, um, you know, it, it all falls apart. Now, it it is hard, but um, you know, Treasury um, has many important programs. It the the higher levels of formality that you get in the economy, the, the easier it is to get. Because at some point, when a business's earnings disappears into a flow of, of cash, um, you know that that's when it's, it's hard to, to show that you know this is narco dollars versus versus other things. But um, across the region, um, there are um, what they call uh, financial intelligence units, um, and there are different structures. And, and sometimes those FIUs working with Treasury. Um, in the processes of basically certif certifying, and not just in the banking sector, but other things that you might not actually think of. And so um, insurance and money chasing houses, there are a whole web of, and of course, you know, some of the, the new financial technologies, what they call fintech, um, are those properly regulated. And so there's a whole kind of universe of things that you have to regulate. Um, and even if you have the laws on the books, um, you need to make sure that these things are, um, you know, that the laws are actually being enforced, that the people overseeing the, the operations are, you know, themselves, you know, not not corrupt. So and Mexico actually has some pretty good laws, and at least on the books, a pretty effective FIU, um, but people are allowed to get away with non-reporting. And, and yes, U.S. banks um, are used. Yes, offshore banks are used. Yes, uh, Chinese banks are, are, are used. Um, you know, some of the places in Latin America where it's a little bit easier not to report or, or you know, you know, Things like that, um, you know, are where some of the, the bigger holes are. But uh, I think uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, HSBC and, and a couple other major banks were actually indicted in a in a major scheme where they were shown to be dirty. So um, yes, absolutely does happen, um, and it is it's it's hard, but it is is it's absolutely um, one of the, one of the things that you you got to do. Well, when we started out through the film, 
the the speaker identified three things that he said was tied to all of this and and the assumption is that if you solve these three things you'd solve this problem so the first was subsidize right get get the money help the farmers do something different the second was wipe it out just eradicate it and i still think even as i was listening to that there must be a way to wipe out those crops that's not so dangerous. There's just got to be something you could put down, even if it's boric acid or something. <laughs> that was, that was, all right. But, and the third, he says, was um, cut the demand in the U.S. All of that makes sense. But I want to now ask you in summary, is the, are these really the three components that we would need to uh, tackle to stop this? Is it stoppable? I mean, is there a solution to this problem? Right. Well, first of all, it's a good question, very important question, um, and there are solutions, and just like in many of our problems, it, um, but there's not one magic bullet to, to make it, it all good or, or, or quickly. Um, and it's interesting because in my own capacity, when I was at the Perry Center, one of the things that I used to work with, with Latin American governments, um, was through modeling and simulation and, and gaming, um, you know, how do you manage these type of things? And, you know, I'll tell you, um, if you... Um, Look at, for example, a military organization, and, and, a, and a military commander will, will look at the enemy, and he'll look at the terrain, and, and you know, and kind of recognizes that you have to bring. You, know, you don't just say, "Well, I'm going to use a little bit of infantry. I'm going to use a little bit of, or uh, or tanks are really good, so I'm going to use just tanks." Because if you use, if you, um, well, is is the Russians discovered in Ukraine? If you just throw in tanks undefended, um, infantry can can wipe them out pretty easily, um, and so. My experience over the years is that um, what you have to do is you have to apply selective pressure um, in in a coordinated way, in an intelligent way, across those those things. And the pressure you apply in any one place, you never have enough resources to fix it with just that thing and, and instantly. Um, so, for example, it is absolutely important to do you know some interdiction or first of all to do some supply side thing whether you know and again I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer that you know things like aerial spraying with glyphosate is actually a relatively safe thing um and you know that needs to be applied you know more broadly um but yes you do need to do effective crop substitution programs so that when you destroy their crops you don't just create social chaos um and create other other type of problems so you know you need to do that better uh you need to do more effective interdiction whether that's intelligence uh, working against labs um whether that's uh, interdicting movement to make sure that those, those wonderful uh, you know technologies like like road scanners are actually not conveniently disabled you know when you know so there are certain things that you can do there and again it's, it's along the way of the supply chain there's and i mean there's maritime interdiction that you have to work there's road interdiction there's interdiction at the borders um and there are a lot of technical problems if you really get into the weeds of you know us working with our, our counterparts to to work those problems um but then as you pointed out there are supply there are demand side things that we need to continue to do. There are, frankly, um, things that we need to continue to do um, with, with respect to going after the money, as we talked about, and frankly, disrupting the organizations. Because if you disrupt the organizations while managing the violence that you unleash, as we see in, in Mexico, when you actually you know take out those leaders or basically take out their, essentially go after the accountants and go after the people who know where the money are and move them. Um, and so at the end of the day, you find, at least in my experience, is that you need to do all of those things. And as soon as you start doing those things, it changes the dynamics of, of the groups. And so you need to be reacting. Um, you need to say, okay, well, this is now becoming important because I've, I've done this. Now I need to move in, in, into this area. Uh, the problem that you, in my experience, the problems that we have is number one, um, the resources that we put against this problem are usually insufficient. Um, and we're always changing programs and canceling programs and suspending things. Um, and we're doing a lot of things that make us feel like we're doing something, but it's not always the, the right thing to, to do. Um, and so you need a something that is more well-resourced and is more constant and is more in intelligent and that continues to adapt. Um, so oftentimes we Every couple of years, we're, we're changing policies. Our partners are changing policies, um, trying something else. And at the end of the day, we continue to throw our hands up. But, but the problem is just we're not learning and going after it and, and continuing to apply what works in, in an intelligent way with on the scale that we, we really need to. And we'll never eradicate this problem completely, but we can make it a lot more manageable. And the interesting thing is about what they call uh, feedback cycles. So again, if you reduce corruption, and so more people, now you have a less corrupt organization, and it becomes more likely that if I'm doing a corrupt thing, I believe that I'm going to get caught, as we have in the United States, then I'm going to be even less likely to 
to, to be corrupt myself. And so the more you fight corruption, the more effective you have against corruption. Or, for example, in communities, the more that you believe that, you know, working with the narcos is not the way to go, and that's a generational thing, the less likely I'm going to be to to join that, and the more likely I'm going to be to work with law enforcement if I believe that they're not all, all corrupt. And so what it really comes down to is if we do those things intelligently for a long amount of time, um, you little by little, you replace those negative feedback cycles with positive feedback cycles. Um, and um, in the end, that's where we need to be. We're no place near those positive cycles. But at the end of the day, I, I'm convinced that, that, that that's the only way to go. Wow. Well, at the end of all this, I think you've actually sound optimistic that there is a solution and that, that, that we actually could uh, make a dent in this. One final thing. Do you think we've gotten better at dealing with this? Or has this just been frustration from the very, I mean, since the war on drugs, have we made any progress? I'm, I'm far more confident in the idea that there are actual effective solutions than I am confident that we as, as flawed human beings are gonna actually come up with the money or resources um, to actually implement those solutions in, in an intelligent way. Um, I think we have gotten better at certain things. I think we've gotten better at going after uh, money laundering. I, I've seen evolutions of, of the FIUs and, and Treasury uh, working with FIUs in, in the region. I think we've frankly gotten better at using technology to go after uh, corruption, uh, you know, lifestyle polys and, and things like that and working with our partners. Um, we've gotten better uh, in terms of of, of the technology of interdiction, identifying you know where illicit crops are, certain places, and going going after them. Um, so, in the technical sense, I think we've gotten more effective. Now, unfortunately, the our adversaries have also gotten better in you know clever things, you know narco submarines and the use of UAVs to know when to go across borders, um, in clever ways to hide. And, and frankly, every time that we're making headway, something happens to make the problem harder. Um, you know, COVID nineteen that took money away and and presence away from law enforcement activities, um, you know, the diversion of resources in, in other ways. And so um, every time that we start making a little bit of progress someplace, something else happens to just, you know, slam us back down into the, the hole, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I'm still an optimist that if we don't give up, things will at least stop getting worse. So, well, I'm yeah. optimistic that we have good brains like yours working on this, researching it, and constantly at least advising the policymakers about what uh, what options they have. So that's at least some good news for all of us. But I really do want to thank you for taking time. I know you're a very busy person because, as I say, I get your writings quite regularly. and I'm, So I know you have a lot on your plate. But thank you for sharing, and we hope to have you back with us again soon. It would be a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity and my very best to, to you and, and, to, and to the group. Absolutely. Thank you, World Affairs Council Associates and the Fredrickson Library guests who were joining us as well. We will see you next week at seven o'clock for the great decisions discussion. Good night, everyone.